that God has been gracious to you throughout the week. It is another Sabbath that he has given us so that we may rest, rejoice and be glad in it. This is New Life program coming to you from Adventist World Radio, the Voice of Hope. I am your host, Tilen Odiambo. The previous Sabbath, we learned how Adam was convinced into eating the forbidden fruit. There had to be a consequence for this action. Today on our Bible story, we will hear about it. Later, we shall be joined by Pastor Kigundu Nwiga, who will be talking about the hilarious giver. Lots of great music also lined up for you, so stay tuned. I hope that you are enjoying the show. Let us now listen to the Bible story on what transpired after Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit. Satan, in the disguise of the serpent, caused Adam and Eve to transgress the law of God. In this he exalted and was not slow in bragging about it to his fellow angels of darkness. <laughs> And, and Eve believed me. <laughs> she actually distrusted God's love after it had been so recently manifested to her, too. <laughs> we believed you, too, remember? You said you would soon be ruling in God's stead. You promised us we would be co-rulers with you. And what actually happened? We were thrown out of heaven. Now we are called imps of darkness. Now we rule this earth. I am the prince of this world. You are my <laughs> right hand. More empty bragging. Listen, you imps, and listen well. Adam was given dominion of the earth. I got it when he yielded his will to mine. This earth is mine, ours. From here we will gain control of all the universe. We will be the rulers of all creation. But what if the... The Creator has some plan whereby Adam and Eve can be saved from your snares. Plan to save mankind? Oh, oh, oh. What good would any plan do? Man has shown his weakness by yielding to me this time. What makes you imagine they'll be stronger to resist me later on? God is all-wise, and he does love his created beings. I think he will devise some plan to save them from sin. <laughs> oh, say, maybe he will. Come, imps. We must be on the alert to detect any plan and stop it before it gets started. After sinning, the love and peace that had been Adam's and Eve's was gone. In its place, they felt a sense of sin, a dread of the future, and a nakedness of soul. Eve, I, I feel the need of clothing now that the robe of light has left us. 
in this condition, I, I don't want to come face to face with God or the holy angels. Oh, I don't either, Adam. Oh, if you just hadn't left my side, Eve, we'd oh. still be safe and secure in the shelter of God's love. But no, you had to leave me and listen to the tempter. Why? Why did you ever believe the serpent? I didn't realize the awfulness of sin, well, Adam. It is awful, Eve. Oh. Yet I, I'm beginning to wonder if God really does love us. And I think he does. Maybe he'll forgive us this one transgression. Do you think he will, Adam? Or perhaps he won't subject us to so dire a punishment as death. Yes, and, well, Adam, after all, it, it was only a small transgression. We only hated the forbidden fruit. Such a small sin can't be so important as to be punishable by death. Now, perhaps God will overlook that one small sin. Yes. After all, he does love us and he did create us. Oh, Adam... There's God, Where? walking in the garden. Oh, quick, we must hide. Yes. I don't want to face him. We'll hide among the trees. There. God won't find us here. Adam. Adam. Don't answer, Adam. Adam. Adam, where art thou? I... I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the fruit, and I did eat. Eve, what is this that thou hast done? The serpent beguiled me, and, and I did eat. O serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Eve, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Adam, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall the ground bring forth, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. He's gone. We're to die, Eve. Even now the cells of our bodies begin to deteriorate as the flowers faded. We should be laid to rest in the dust of the ground. Then we must pay the penalty? Death? Yes. We must pay, as all mankind must. Adam! Adam! Here I am. I am come to give you these garments of skin. Put them on. As you wish. And God bade me drive thee and thy wife out of the Garden of Eden, lest you put forth thy hand and eat of the tree of life and perpetuate sin. We must leave our garden home? Yes, Eve. You must oh. go forth from the garden and till the ground from whence thou wast taken. But this is our home. I, I don't want to leave. Oh, forgive her. <laughs> She's heartbroken. See that thou goest forth from the garden immediately. We will go. I don't want to go, Adam. Eve, we <laughs> sinned. No longer are we worthy of the blessings of this paradise home. 
Come, Eve. We'll go forth from this garden. We will henceforth obey God. We will build a new home wherein dwells only love and obedience for each other and obedience to God. Yes, Adam. In case you feel like contributing something in form of ideas to this program, feel free to send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 42276, code 00100, Nairobi, Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi.eau.adventist.org. This is New Life Program, coming to you from Adventist World Radio, The Voice of Hope. I am your presenter, Tilen Odiambo. Let us now listen to Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga with his topic, The Hilarious Giver. Be educated. Dear listener, I want to welcome you to our Biblical Stewardship Series. Our topic is the hilarious giver or the generous giver. Alan Redpath wrote a book, Blessings Out of Buffeted, and he said, Once you see the matter of giving is centered in this lovely word grace, it lifts the whole act away from mechanics, from pressure and duty, from obligation and mere legalism. It lifts us up into the most lovely atmosphere of an activity which seeks by giving out to convey to others all that is lovely, all that is beautiful, all that is good, and all that is glorious. Now the churches in Macedonia were going through extremely difficult economic times. They were so deep in poverty that Paul didn't even ask them to give to us the offering of the poor in Jerusalem. He knew they couldn't afford it. But then they embarrassed Paul by begging for an opportunity to be part of the project. This is a story that is recorded in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1 to 4. They saw a great need and didn't want to be left out. They were so moved by the Holy Spirit's prompting that they insisted on being part of the support system so that they could support the saints in Jerusalem. Well, When we talk about giving, we said, giving begins with giving yourself. Hilarious giving, let me repeat, begins with giving of yourself. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 5. When we look at the Macedonians, we ask, how did they do it? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 5, they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. This is always where stewardship must begin. 
They first gave themselves unto the Lord. They had an intimate love relationship with the Lord God. When you fall in love with the Lord Jesus, you'll give from the heart, because he's first in everything. These Macedonians, Paul says, are an example to us of those who give by the principle of grace. Out of their love for the Lord, they gave according to their ability, and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. There was no show, no competition, and no one applied any pressure on them. And when we read the Bible, that is in Philippians 2 verse 6, uh, verse 9, the Bible says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus chose to give up the manifestation of his glory and take on all the abject poverty of a slave. That is Philippians 2 verse 6 to 9. He did it because he loves you. He did it so that you could become extremely rich. You are rich in his grace. You are rich in his love. You are rich in a right relationship with God, rich in the Holy Spirit, rich in promises, and rich in power. When you are the recipient of this kind of grace, you can't help but respond in kind. Don't miss what happened in the heart of the Macedonian believers. God made them exceedingly rich in his grace, not financially rich. This is not prosperity gospel nonsense. This is not some religious get-rich scheme. You put Christ first in every area and your life and give financially as he enables you and you'll be enriched beyond measure. That is the principle of giving. Ron Blue writes in his book, Master your money, that is page 19 and 20. Very few Christians would argue with the principle that God owns it all. And yet if we follow that principle to its natural conclusion, there are three revolutionary implications. First of all, God has a right to whatever he wants, wherever he wants it. It's all is because an owner has rights, and I as a steward has only responsibilities. If I really believe that God owns it all, then when I lose any possession for whatever reason, my emotions may cry out, but my mind and spirit have no slightest questions as to the right of God to take whatever he wants whenever he wants. Really believing this also frees me to give generously of God's resources to God's purposes and his people. All that I have belongs to him. The second implication of God's owning it all is that not only is my giving decision a spiritual decision, but every spending decision is a spiritual decision. As a steward, I have a great deal of latitude, but I am still responsible to the owner. Someday, dear listener, I'll give an accounting of how I used his property. The third implication of the truth that God owns it all is that you can't fake stewardship. Your checkbook or your receipts reveal all that you really believe about stewardship. Your goals, your priorities, your convictions, your relationships, and even the use of your time. A person who has been a Christian for even a short while can fake prayer, Bible study, evangelism, going to church, and so on, but he can't fake what his checkbook reveals. So how do we practice the grace of giving? Paul reminded the Corinthians that they made a pledge to give to the Jerusalem offering. A year had now gone by, and they had not fulfilled their promise. They had been caught up in bickering and fighting with one another. There were divisions within the church. They were sidetracked with dissensions, immorality, and drunkenness, quarreling over spiritual gifts rather than keeping their eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of preoccupations kept them from fulfilling their pledge to God. Are making pledges wrong? We live every day on the principle of pledges. I am living my life based on pledges. I have pledged to pay the utility companies at the end of every month. I drive my car on the promise that I'll pay my car loan. 
I live in a house by promising to pay my rent monthly. How strange that some think it is wrong to make a sincere promise to God from what he has promised for us when we have already made pledges to hard-hearted human creditors. Well, it's all really in the attitude, so go ahead and do as you sense God leading you. Since he has blessed you bountifully, go ahead and give as you purposed in your heart to do. Follow through with your pledge. And please, when you give, don't do it grudgingly. The word grudgingly means out of grief, sorrow, and pain of mind or spirit. Don't do it as if it were killing you. Don't give reluctantly as if you are grieving over what you have lost in the process. Oh man, I gave that money and I could have kept it and rented a couple of uh, films or eaten late or go, gone out on a date. Why in the world did I do that? No, no, no. Don't ask yourself those questions. Don't give grudgingly or under compulsion. Let it come from a heart that is overflowing with God's wonderful grace and love. It's all in your attitude. You, and you know what? God loves a cheerful giver. The English transliteration of the word cheerful, that is hilaros, is hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. Second Corinthians 9 verse 7. He desires our giving to come from the heart that is cheerful, a heart that is joyous, prompt, ready to do anything. So, is there readiness and joy in your giving? Or is there the attitude of an old gripe, grudgingly holding on to every coin? But neither does God want us to be like a drunkard sailor who throws his money away on drinks for everyone. He wants us to be responsible givers who give out of the heart that is overflowing with God's grace. Now, God does not bless us to enrich our own selfishness. He does it that his name will be glorified and that his eternal purpose will be accomplished. God is not in the modern uh, prosperity gospel movement. Often in his all-sufficient wisdom, he works just the opposite to accomplish his purposes in our lives. Second Corinthians 9 verse 10 and 11, read that. God blesses us abundantly so that we can bless others abundantly. He wants our giving to be a blessing, a means of producing thanksgiving to God. He takes your gift and uses it that his name will be glorified repeatedly. People see your gift and they offer up thanksgiving to God. Those who are recipients praise God and pray for you. Your gift keeps repeating itself in people's lives. A prominent Christian businessman shared his testimony of how he came to Christ. It was during the Great American Depression. There was a missionary sharing the needs of the mission field. An appeal was made to continue the missionary work even in the midst of abject poverty. They took up an offering that night. This young believer sat there in the audience and knew that he had only one silver dollar to his name. That was all the money he had in the world. He said he could at the moment feel the tremendous pull of the Holy Spirit leading him to contribute to this great need. All he had was that silver dollar coin. He said to the ladies, I reached in my pocket and I took out that silver coin, all I had in the world, and I laid it on the plate and gave my all to Jesus, expecting God to meet my need. He then told how God richly blessed him throughout the years. He had now come to the place of prominent power and possessions. As he was standing there, a woman in the audience spoke up and said, I dare you do it again. This is exactly what God calls you to do. He makes us exceedingly rich so that we can become paupers again by making others rich. Remember the Lord owns it all. We are his stewards. My prayer, dear listener, is may the Lord bless you spiritually as he has blessed you financially. That marks the end of our New Life program today. Be sure to send us your views comments, and suggestions concerning their program. Write to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box 
42276 code 00100 Nairobi Kenya. Our email address is awrnairobi@eau.adventist.org. Have a blessed Sabbath and enjoy the rest of your listening. I have been your host Tilen Odiambo. <music>